So please allow me to extend a warm welcome to the Neil Wheeler Watson speaker for 2010, Bruno Latour, Professor and Vice President for Research at L'Institut d'Etudes Politiques de Paris, who will speak on the topic, May Nature Be Recomposed? A few questions of cosmopolitics. Thank you. A warm applause. Thank you very much. Sounds very much like the sort of argument that people give before giving the Nobel Prize. It's my only chance to be in this place because this is the place for the literature Nobel Prize, the one which I'm sure not to get. <laughs> I'm also very interested to see in the exhibition beneath that uh, Alfred Nobel had some trouble with the French. He said that the French are arrogant and that they believe a brain is a French uh, organ. <laughs> this is a quote from Alfred Nobel in the film. I don't share this arrogance. <laughs> what I'm going to uh, talk today is trying to find a word as an alternative to modernization. And the word I want to use is the word composition. The nuance I want to outline is between progress and progressive. It's as if we had to move from an idea of inevitable progress to one of progressive, tentative, and precautionary progression. It's still a movement. It's still a movement forward. But the tenor seems to me entirely different. And since it's impossible to draft something about compositionism without using an ism, like communism, futurism, surrealism, I want to name my argument compositionism. <laughs> Even though the word compositionism is a bit too long and windy, what is nice is that it underlines the thing I have to put together while retaining their heterogeneity. And heterogeneity is really the main argument tonight. Also, it's connected with composure. It has a clear root in art, painting, music, theater, dance, and thus is associated with choreography and scenography. It's not too far from compromise and compromising, so there is a certain diplomatic and prudential flavor to it. Above all, a composition can fail and thus retain what is most important in the notion of constructivism, a label which has already been taken, of course. It thus draws attention away from the irrelevant differences between what is constructed and what is not constructed, and shifted to the very crucial difference between what is well constructed and what is badly constructed or composed. What is to be composed may at any point be decomposed. Compositionism thus takes up the task of searching for universality, but without believing that this universality is already there, waiting to be simply unveiled and discovered. It thus as far from relativism, in the banal sense of the word, as it is from universalism. From universalism, it takes up the task of building up the common word, but from relativism, the certainty that this common word has to be built from utterly heterogeneous part, but will never make a whole, but at best a fragile, revisable, and diverse composition. Now, I have to say that I had prepared slides, but I didn't realize most of the people will not see my slide on this small screen. Obviously, this is for the Nobel Prize of Literature, not for the liberal, and very rarely people in literature use slides, apparently. Uh, so I decided to switch up from Charlie the slides that no one will see, and maybe in the discussion I'll show some of it. So I will stick to words like we do in literature. <laughs> Even for the word post-natural, begins to pop up, for instance, in Errol Ellis' post-natural environmentalism, compositionism would probably be more comfortable with the word pre-naturalism or, even more shocking, multi-naturalism. Critique, which is the opposition of composition in this argument, was wedded to a very odd definition of nature, taken here as the discovery revelation, unveiling of what lay behind the subjective fog of appearances 
and what ensured, this is the key argument I want to discuss with you, the continuity in space and time of all beings in their inner reality. It has long been realized by science studies, my own field, some eminent people of this field are here actually, and in a much wider way by all sorts of environmental movement, that the character of the age is precisely not the taking into account of at last nature, but the complete dissolution of nature. In brief, ecology, or rather political ecology, is the end of nature. Nature is not a thing, a domain, a realm, an ontological territory. It is, or rather it has been during the modern parenthesis, a way of organizing the division, what Whitehead calls the bifurcation of nature, between appearances and reality, subjectivity and objectivity, history and immutability. A fully transcendent, a fully historical construct, a deeply religious way, but not in the religious sense of the word, to create the difference of potential between what human souls were attached to and what was really out there. And also, as I've shown elsewhere, a fully political way of distributing power in what I've called the modernist constitution, a sort of unwritten compact between what could be and what could not be discussed. Not an ideal way, as one can easily see now, to establish a political ecology if you begin to trace beforehand what can be discussed and what is absolutely out of any discussion. This was the time of a great political, religious, legal, and epistemological invention of matters of fact, embedded in a res extensa, devoid of any meaning except that of being the ultimate reality, made nonetheless of entities fully silent and yet able, through the mysterious intervention of science, capital S, of speaking by themselves, but without the mediation of science, small s, and scientist. This whole modernist scenography, primary quality and secondary quality, to use the philosophical term, appear to us now the queerest anthropological construction, especially because progress under the label of reason, capital here, was defined as the quick substitution of its odd nature to what remains subjective, local, cultural, human, valued. The more natural we would become, the more rational we will be, and the easier will be the agreement between all reasonable human beings. This composition now lies in ruin, but without having been superseded by any other more realistic and especially more livable this construction. In that sense, we are still postmodern. This is precisely the point where compositionism wishes to take over. What is the successor of the notion of nature? Of course, no one has ever lived in nature, in the res extensa sense of the word. No atom, no virus, no organism, no technical project has ever resided in res extensa. They have all lived in the pluriverse, to use James' term. Where else, could have they, where else could have they found their abode? As soon as the bifurcation had been invented at the time of Descartes and Locke, it has been immediately undone by philosophers, poets, and of course scientists. No composition was so fiercely decomposed. Remember, we have never been modern. So this utopia of nature has always been just that, a utopia, a word of beyond, without any realistic grasp on the practice of science, technology, commerce, and industry. This is what is so surprising. And yet it has retained the same enormous power over the political epistemology of a modern, not a power of explanation, of course, but the power to create this very difference of potential that has given critique its steam and modernism its impetus. So the question now for those who wish to inherit from modernism without being postmodern is what it is to live without this difference of potential. 
where will we get the energy to act without such a gigantic steam engine, so to speak? Where will compositionism take its steam? What will it be to move forward without this engine, the nature engine, and to move collectively? That is billions of people and their trillions of affiliates and commensals. Such a total disconnect between the ruins of naturalism on the one hand and the slow and painful emergence of its successor could be made very clear in the funny bout of agitation during the Copenhagen event, or non-event, I should say. In Copenhagen, around what has been called the climate gate, I'm sure many of you have followed it carefully, suddenly, critiques and proponents of the anthropic cause of climate change realized by sifting through the thousands of email and climate scientists that had been robbed by activists of very dubious pedigrees, we know that now, that scientific fact of the matter had to be slowly composed. And by whom? By humans. By squabbling humans, assembling data, having instrument to make the climate speak. Instrument, can you believe that? And spotty data set, data set. Imagine that. And those scientists had money problems. Quince, quince. And they had to message, write, correct, and rewrite humble text and article. What? Text to be written? Is science made of text? How shocking. <laughs> what was so interesting in the hysterical reaction of scientists and the press was the almost full agreements of opponents and proponents who seem to share the same ideal of science, capital S. If science is slowly composed, it cannot be true, said the skeptic. If we reveal how it's composed, said the proponents of anthropic cause, it will be discussed, thus disputable. Thus it cannot be true, however. Again, the old opposition between what is constructed and what is not constructed instead of a slight but crucial difference between what is well and what is badly constructed and composed. And this revelation, just at the moment when the disputability of the most important tenets of what it is for billions of humans represented by the heads of state to live collectively on the planet was fully visible in the vast pandemonium of the biggest diplomatic fair ever assembled. Clearly, when faced with the stunning revelation of a climate gate, it would not be enough to rejoice in the discovery of a humble human dimension of scientific practice. It was, this would still be believing in the banking. It still be equipped with the armament of critique. As if, again, we had to oppose the pure realm of unmediated and undisputable fact to that of squabbling humans. We want immanence and truth together, says the compositionist. Or to use my language, we want matters of concern, not simply matters of fact. It was the ideal moment to connect the disputability of politics and the disputability of science, small s. Instead of trying to maintain against all evidence the usual gap between what is politics and what can be discussed. And science, capital S, that is beyond dispute. For a compositionist, nothing is beyond dispute. And yet closure has to be achieved. But by the slow process of composition and compromise, not by the revelation of the world of beyond. Just before Copenhagen, the French philosopher Michel Serres wrote in the newspaper Libération a rather nice piece summarizing the argument he had made, some of you probably know this book, The Natural Contract. The paper was called La Non Invité au Sommet de Copenhague, that is the one not invited and the summit. This was, of course, Gaia, whom he called something else for some strange reason. Sir, peace point to one empty seat in Copenhagen Parliament of Thing, that of the Earth. And he wondered how to make it sit and speak and be represented. 
Unfortunately, their solution was to join together the language, rituals, and practice of politics, good at representing human, and the language, procedures, and rituals of science, good at reproducing fact. But this is easier said than done. What he dreamed, much like Hans Jonas earlier in the 20th century, was in effect a government of scientists, a, modern, a modernist dream, if any, able to speak the two languages at once. A very French temptation from the gouvernement des savants during the revolution, all the way to our atomic program and our celebration of corps technique de l'état. I've been teaching for 25 years in one of them. But if those two languages are the inheritors of a great bifurcation, we have not moved an inch. We would have simply conjoined the worst of politics with the worst of science. That is the true traditional way to produce undisputability. We have been there already. This was the dream of Marxism, just as it is today the dream, now in tatters, of run-of-a-mill economists. A science of politics instead of a total transformation of what it is to do politics. How to represent non-human and what it is to do science with entangled and controversial scientists all the way down around disputable matters of concern. To believe in this government des savants has been precisely the mistake made by so many environmentalists when they interpreted the present crisis as the great comeback of nature instead of its total demise. Between the belief in nature and the belief in politics, one has to choose. Needless to say that the Copenhagen event was in that respect a completely and probably predictably failure. Not that we have as yet no world government able to enforce the decision, in the unlikely case there would have been any, but because we have as yet no idea of what it is to govern the world. Now that nature as an organizing concept or conceit rather is gone. We can't live on planet Earth. Not on Pandora. I've been very taken by uh, Cameron's uh, film on Avatar, but I will save you this part because it's a beautiful film in my view on how we simulate the fact that we cannot live on Pandora, meaning we can't live on the Earth either. So we can't live here. One thing is sure, and the climate gate is a good case in point, it's utterly impossible to reuse the division between science and politics invented by the modern, even by conjoining them. Two artificial constructions put together make for a third artificial contrivance, not for a solution to a problem made very consciously impossible at the birth of the 17th century, as Shapin and Sheffers have shown many years ago, somewhere between a hops and boil to point out at locus classicus of science studies. Nature was invented to render politics important. There is no reason why a politics of nature ever deliver a better promise. I now have a feeling more and more every day that we are actually closer to the 16th century than to the 20th century, very much for the same reason as Stephen Toulmin argues in his book, Cosmopolitan. Precisely because the settlement that has created the bifurcation in the first place lies in ruin and has to be entirely recomposed. Which means that we find a strange air of familiarity with the time before its invention and implementation when people deride the time before the epistemological break, to use Althusser's favorite uh, fully modernist expression, it's because earlier episteme, this is also in Foucault, of course, was making too many connections between what they call the micro and the macro cosmos. But is it not exactly what we now see emerging everywhere under the name of post-natural? The destiny of all the cosmos, or rather cosmoi, is now fully interconnected now that 
through our very progress and through our own very proliferating numbers, we have taken the earth on our shoulder, as is made so clear by the striking neologism Anthropocene. Of course, what is entirely lost today is the notion of an harmony between the two, micro and macro. But that there is and there should be a connection between those two destiny, this seems now obvious to all. And there might be many more than two, the human and the non-human, as any reader of a 16th century boiling cauldron may easily gather. Four centuries later, micro and macro cosmos are now literally, literally, and not only metaphorically connected. And the result is, so to speak, is to speak Greek, a kakosmos. That is a horrible and disgusting mess. Yes, but a kakosmos is a cosmos nonetheless. Hence the word cosmopolitics, which is not used as a way to say cosmopolit, meaning universal, but as a politics of a cosmos. At any rate, it certainly no longer resembles the bifurcated nature of a recent past with, on the one hand, primary qualities, real, speechless, speaking by themselves, but alas, devoid of any meaning and any value, going one way, while the secondary quality, subjective, meaningful, talkative, full of value, but alas, empty of any reality, go their own separate way. In that sense, we feel, at least I feel closer than never from the time of before the famous epistemological break, a radical divide that has always been radically thought, but never, of course, actually practiced since we have never been modern. When Alexandre Coiré wrote from the closed world to the infinite universe, little could he predict that barely half a century later, the infinite universe had become a finite, finite or involved or implicated cosmos again. There is no way to devise a successor to nature if we do not tackle again the tricky question of animism. One of the principal cause of irony poured by the modern upon the 16th century, as you know, is that those poor archaic folks who had the misfortune of living on the wrong side of an epistemological break believed in a word animated by all sorts of entities and forces instead of believing, like any rational mind, into an inanimate matter producing its effect only for a pair of its antecedent causes. It's this conceit that is at the root of all the critique of environmentalists as being anthropocentric, because they attribute values, price, agency, purpose to what cannot have and should not have any intrinsic value. Lions, whales, viruses, CO2, monkeys, ecosystem, or worse of all, Gaia. The accusation of anthropomorphism is so strong that it paralyzes all the effort of many scientists in many fields, but especially biology, to go beyond the narrow constraint of what is called materialism or reductionism. It immediately gives to the effort a sort of new age flavor, as if the default position was the idea of the inanimate and the bizarre innovation was that of the animate. Add agency? They must be mad or marginal. Consider Lovelock, for instance, and his absurd idea of the Earth as a quasi-organism. But what should appear extraordinarily bizarre, in my view, is on the contrary, the invention of inanimate entity, which would do nothing else but carry one step further the cause that make them act to the n plus one consequent for which they are in turn nothing but the cause. This conceit as the strange result to compose the world with long concatenation of causes and effect, where, this is what is odd, nothing is supposed to happen, except probably at the beginning, but there is no God at the beginning. 
The disappearance of agency in the so-called materialist worldview is a stunning invention, especially because it's contradicted every single time by the odd resistance of reality. Every consequence adds slightly to the cause. Thus, it has to have some sort of agency. There is a supplement, a gap between the two. If not, there would not be even a way to discriminate the cause from the consequence. This is true in particle physics as well as in chemistry, biology, psychology, and of course, sociology. Thus, although in practice, every agency has to be distributed at each step throughout the whole concatenation, in theory, nothing happens but the strict transportation without deformation of a cause. To use my technical language, although every state of affair manifests association of mediators, everything is supposed to happen as if only chains of purely passive intermediary had to unfold. Paradoxically, the most stubborn realism, the most rational outlook is predicated on the most unrealistic, the most contradictory notion of an action without agency. Without agency. Of course, it had one great advantage, that of ensuring the continuity of space and time by connecting all entities throughout concatenation of causes and consequences. No composition necessary for this assembly of nature. It's already assembled. Nature is always already assembled, since nothing happens but what is coming from before. It is enough to have a cause. The consequence will follow, adding nothing of their own except the carrying further of the same undisputable set of characteristics. Let them go, and they will build up the cage of nature. Anyone who denies their existence will introduce discontinuities. People like Darwin, people like von Huxul, everybody studying project instead of object, the whole science studies, and so on, most of biology, who let agency proliferate pointing out many interesting gaps between causes and consequence will be considered deviant, a madman, a dreamer, not a rational being anyway. If there is one thing about which to wonder in the history of modernism, it's not that there are still people mad enough to believe in animism, but that so many hard-headed thinkers have invented what should be called inanimism and have tied to this sheer impossibility their definition of what it is to be rational and scientific. It's inanimism that is the queer invention, an agency without agency constantly denied by practice. This is what lies at the heart of the modernist constitution. And as the great French anthropologist Philippe Descola so nicely shown in his book, what makes it even odder is that this inanimism, that's what he called naturalism, is the most anthropocentric of the whole full mode of relation invented, according to him, across the world to deal with, to deal with collectives of humans and non-humans. All of the other, I remind you that there are four in the scheme of this color. I had a nice slide, but you won't see them are trying to underline as much as possible the agency at each step, especially the one which is the counter position of naturalism that is called animism precisely. But for purely anthropocentric, that is, political reason, naturalist, which is basically us, I assume the Swedes are in the same anthropological category as the French, I mean, not as modernist, that's impossible, but basically naturalist, have built their collective to make sure that subject and object, culture and nature be utterly distinct. Of course, not in reality, but in the way we represent association. This is why rationalists never detect the contradiction between what they say about the continuity of causes and consequences and what they have to witness. That is the discontinuity, the invention, 
was supplement, the creativity, which is, of course, wider term, creativity is ultimate, between association of mediators. They have simply transformed this discrepancy that would have made their worldview untenable into a radical divide between human, human subject and non-human objects. I mean, I have to explain a little bit that in, for those of you who don't know Descola. One be better way to say it is that uh, Levi Strauss mentioned a very interesting experiment going on at the time of the Valladolid controversy. During the Valladolid controversy, the monks and the priests and the bishop were trying to see the Indians, as you know, as a soul. But at the meantime, mean, at the same time, says Levi Strauss, on the coast of Pernambuc, the Indians were trying to see if the Spanish had a body. <laughs> and that was their big worry, because everyone there has a soul, but a body that's disputable. So they took prisoners from, the Sp from Spanish and put them in big vats of water to let them drown and see if they rot or not. If they rot, it means they have a body, indeed. If they don't, it means they are just soul. So the same, and Levi Strauss with his uh, tongue in cheek says, on the whole, the Indians were more scientist-like because they believed in natural science instead of believing in social science like the monks and the <laughs> bishops. Now, on that anecdote, Vivero de Castro and uh, Descola have been the whole very interesting argument of anthropology that we believe we have the same bodies and divided by our soul and opinions and subjectivity, while the Indians, Amazony, a large part of the rest of the world, um, the east of Siberia and so on, believe exactly the opposite, that we all, animals, plants, and of course human, by default are human society, but we are divided by our body. So the big point for us is solipsism, how do we know we share opinions, and the big problem for Indians is actually uh, the danger of anthropophagy, that you, cannibalism, you, you might eat a human instead of eating an animal. Anyway, this is just to remind you that Indians don't live in nature. They never had nature to live in. Nature is a completely anthropological, historical connection, a very, very small, short-timed, and highly specific completely anthropocentric, according to Descola, definition of what it is to establish connection between human and non-human. Rationalists have simply transformed this discrepancy into a radical divide between human, human subject and non-human object. Extraordinary feat. Having made for purely anthropocentric reason the accusation of being anthropocentric a deadly weapon, in the fight for establishing the continuity of space and time without having to compose it, it has been the most anthropomorphic who have succeeded in rejecting all the other as practicing the most horrible, archaic, dangerous, and reactionary form of animism. Do I wish not to have this argument confused with a plea against reductionism. In all disciplines, reductionism offers enormously useful handles to allow scientists to insert the instrumentarium, their paradigm, and to produce long series of practical effect. But the success at handling entities by generating result and industry out of them is not the same thing as building the cage of nature with its long chains of causes and consequences. It's actually exactly the opposite. What reductionism shows in practice is that only the proliferation of ingenious detour, of highly localized set of skill, is able to extract interesting and useful results from a multitude of agency. And if the question time gets too tough, I will ask my two colleagues here of science to be much better and much more qualified than me to show you some example of that, in physics especially. Consider how fabulously useful the central dogma of the first version of DNA has been to begin to unlock the power of gene. And yet there is no active biologist to believe that this earlier version could be of any use to build the naturalistic definition of what it is for an organism to live. There is a complete and continuously growing disconnect between the efficient handles and the scenography of nature. 
once you background this proliferation of tricks and knacks and skills, you do not define the nature of things. You simply enter into something else entirely, the spurious continuity of nature. And the same could be shown every time you move from the reductionist handles to reductionism as a philosophical, that is a political worldview. Compositionists, however, cannot rely on such a ploy. The continuity of all agents in space and time is not given to them as it was to naturalists. That's a big difference. They have to compose it slowly and progressively and to compose it from discontinuous pieces. Not only because human destiny, microcosm, and non-human destiny, macrocosm, are now entangled for everyone to see, contrary to the strange dream of bifurcation between primary and secondary qualities, but for a much deeper reason on which it depends the very capture of the creativity of all agencies. Consequences overflow their causes, and this overflow has to be respected everywhere, in every domain, every discipline, and for every type of entity. It's no longer possible to build the cage of nature, and indeed it has never been possible to live in this cage. We are not in a zoo. This is, after all, what is meant by the ACOS of ecology. Call it animism if you wish, but it will no longer be enough to brand it with the mark of infamy. This is indeed why we feel so close to the 16th century, as if we were back before the epistemological break, before the odd invention of matter, as White had shown a highly idealist construct, as he showed in Concept of Nature, a very important book for that argument, of course. As science studies has documented over and over again, the notion of matter is too political, too anthropomorphic, too narrowly historical, too ethnocentric to be ab able to define the stuff out of which the poor human race expulsed from modernism as to build its abode. We need to have a much more material, much more mundane, much more immanent, but above all, much more realistic definition of a material world if we wish to compose this common world. Also, for a reason that would have seen not as important in the 16th century, but which is the hallmark of ours, as I alluded to with the climate gate, namely the proliferation of scientific controversy. This is a well-known phenomenon, but it's indispensable to emphasize at this juncture. What makes really impossible now to rely anymore on the continuity of space and time implied in the notion of nature and its undisputable chains of causes and consequence is the foregrounding of the very practice of science and of the many controversy inside the science themselves. Once again, this phenomenon is lamented by rationalists who still wish to paint science as able to produce incontrovertible, undisputable, mouth-shutting matters of fact. But I, if I dare say, the fact of a matter is that matters of fact are in great risk of disappearing like so many other endangered species. Or else they are dealing with trifling subjects of no interest to anyone anymore. If you think of it, rare are now the topics where you do not see publicly scientists disagreeing among themselves on what it is, how it should be studied, financed, portrayed, diffused, understood, or cast. Facts have become issues. And the more important the issue, the least certain we now publicly are of how to handle them. Think of a fracas around the H1N1 influenza, of a volcano ash, which is another very nice case, or uh, red tuna. And one of my favorites is actually red tuna, because Sarkozy is associated with red tuna in a very nice way. And ladies and gentlemen, this is good. This is good. At least for compositionists, 
since it now adds a first source of discontinuity, forcing all of us, scientists, activists, politicians alike, to compose the common word from disjointed pieces instead of taking for granted that the unity continuity agreement is already there, embedded into the same nature fits all. The increase of disputability and the amazing extension of scientific and technical controversy, while somewhat terrifying at first, is also the best path to finally take seriously the political task of establishing the continuity of all entities that make up the common world. Again, between nature and politics, one has to choose. I hope it's now clear why I said earlier that why this choice was so important. If you have nature, the composition and the continuity is already made. We are united by nature and divided only by secondary quality. Once nature is not there, we have to compose the common word from disjointed parts. To conclude, I have a strange fantasy that the modernist hero had never actually looked to the future, but always to the past, the archaic past that he was flying in terror. I don't wish to embrace Benjamin's angel of history tired trope, but there is something right in the position he attributed to the angel. It looks behind and not ahead. But contrary to Benjamin's interpretation, the modern, who is flying backward, yeah, this is very odd. Um, If I was a dancer, I would do it very well, but I'm not. <laughs> so flying backward is very actually very difficult. I have a dancer who is doing for me. The modern who is flying backward is, not, is actually not seeing the destruction he is generating in his flight since they happen in his back, right? So you, you move out like that and you destroy things. Sort of. It's only recently, by a sudden conversion, a metanoia of sort, that he, he I, I put it a he, it has to be a he for some reason, he has suddenly realized how much catastrophe his development has created behind him. The ecological crisis is nothing but the sudden turning over of someone who had actually never before looked into the future. So busy he was to extricate himself from a horrible past, okay? There is something Egyptian in this hero fleeing this past so fiercely that he cannot realize, except too late, that it's precisely his flight that has created the destruction he was trying to avoid in the first place. Tragic it was with Oedipus pursued by D.K., the fate who reign, as you know, even of the gods. But with the modern, there is no God, so it's actually no tragedy. No, simply a gigantic, myopic, bloody, and sometimes comical blunder. Actually, just like the charge of the people in the sky from Iowa in Avatar, for those of you. Moderns have never contemplated their future until a few years back. That's my argument. They were too busy fleeing the past in terror. And the great advance would be made in the anthropology if we were able to discover what horror they were fleeing that gave them so much energy to flee. When the modern called, what the modern called their future was never seen face to face since it was the future of someone fleeing one's past backward. Wait. Slightly bizarre, I agree. This is why their future, what they call their future before they turn around, 
is always a utopia. Hyped. Completely hyped. The French language, for once richer than English, may differentiate le futur de l'avenir. In French, I could say that the moderns had un futur, but never, until a few years back, un avenir. To define the present situation, I have to translate and say that the modern always had a future, this odd utopian future of someone fleeing his past in reverse, okay? But never a chance, until recently that is, to turn what I call their prospect, trying to find a word for avenir, the shape of things to come at them. As it's now clear from the ecological crisis, the future and the prospect are, bears almost no resemblance to one another. No more than matters of fact and matters of concern or critique and composition. What makes the time we are in so interesting is that we are progressively discovering that just at the time when people are desperate to see they might in the end have no future, we suddenly have many prospects, but so utterly different from what we imagine while fleeing backward ahead, fleeing backward ahead, that we are casting them only as so many fragile illusions, or depending on which ecological school you pertain, catastrophe. The first reaction is to do nothing. S so strong is the modernist temptation to exclaim, let us flee as before and have our past future back. There exist these people. Instead of saying, let us stop fleeing, abandon our future, turn our back, finally, to our past, finally, and explore our new prospect, what lies ahead, the fate of things to come. Of course, what we see when we do that is not pretty. No prettier than what was unfolding in the spiritual eyes of the Angelus Novus in Benjamin's fable. To be sure, it's not a well-composed cosmos, a beautiful and harmonious Pandora planet, but as I said, a rather hor horrendous cacosmos. Now, think of it. How would the modern have succeeded in assembling anything properly while never looking at it? This is what is so extraordinary in the anthropology of the modern. It would be like playing the piano while turning one's back to the keyboard. How do you assemble a cosmos while seeing backwards? It's impossible to compose without being firmly attending the task at hand. But for horror for horror, it does not have the same feature than the archaic past they fled in terror for so long. For one good reason, from this horror, the one that comes at us, you cannot flee. It's coming at you. This is the great, what is so bizarre and so powerful in Lovelock's writing. Not because he's a great writer, but because Gaia is coming at us. No use to speak of epistemological breaks anymore. Breaking with the past will not do. No critique will be of any help. It's time to compose in all the meaning of the word, including to compose with, that is to compromise, to care, to move slowly with caution and precaution. That's quite a new set of skills to learn. Imagine that, innovating as never before, but with precaution. This is why it was so difficult to train engineers when I was at the school of mine. I mean, what it is to innovate with precaution. Certainly, Nobel himself will never succeed at that. 
Two great temptation here again, inherited from a time of a great flight. Abandon all innovation. That's Frankenstein's story in the normal way. Innovate as before without any precaution. The modernist paraphernalia have to be remade one by one for the task that now lie ahead and no longer behind. Oedipus has met the Sphinx and she said, look ahead. Well, the moderns, of course, knowing now fully well that they are blind fumbling in the dark, led by, sorry, blind led by blind, are in great need of new captors and senses. Well, you might have noticed that there is some connection between compositionism and communism, especially the Communist Manifesto. A belief in critique, in radical critique, a commitment to a fully idealized material world, a total confidence in the science of economics, economics of all sciences, a delight in the transformative power of negation, a trust in dialectics, a complete disregard for precaution, an abandon of liberty in politics behind a critique of liberalism, and above all, an absolute trust in the inevitable thrust of progress. So the comparison doesn't look so good. And yet the two arguments have something in common, namely the search for the common. The thirst for the common word is what there is of communism in compositionism, with this small but crucial difference that it has to be slowly composed instead of being taken for granted and imposed. Everything happens as if the human race was on the move again. Expulsed from one utopia, that of economics, and in search of another one, that of ecology. Two different interpretations of this precious little root, ACOS. The first one being a dystopia, but the second being a promise that absolutely no one knows as yet how to fulfill, how a livable and breathable home can be built for those errant masses. That is the only question worth raising in compositionism. And to finish on Avatar, there is hope in Pandora's box. I should say that Cameron actually took his idea from his film from my own book called Pandora's Hope. Why did he call this planet Pandora's, if not because he read, read Pandora's hope? There is hope in Pandora's box, but how deep one has to go in order to fetch it, that's for us, ladies and gentlemen, to decide. Thank you very much for inviting me tonight.